This is a lecture about income tax for non-income tax people. And that's a very important point to start off with, that income tax has in itself become a profession. And when we're dealing with MBAs and PDMs, they are not going to be income tax specialists, otherwise they'd be doing an age of tax or some other qualification. The Income Tax Act has extended enormously over the last 20 years and it is impossible for anybody to know it all. So you have to start off, not in the Income Tax Act, but by looking at your fiduciary responsibilities in terms of the standards of conduct in the Companies Act. So there we have section 76 again. It says a director should be reasonably informed about matters concerning the company and have a basis for believing that he acted in the best interests of the company. Now that is very important when it comes to income tax because one of your biggest stakeholders in a company is your revenue collection function under SARS. So we have to get that right. And we have to say going further in discharging your duties as a director, you are entitled to rely on the performance of other persons uh, operating and reporting to the board. In other words, you are allowed to delegate. And in particular, you can go to reliable and competent employees, counsel, accountants, professionals, etc., who are retained and paid for their services, as well as any committee of the board that might be delegated to deal with a tax matter. So what we've got to presume here is that you are sitting on a board of directors, you've got to have enough knowledge about income tax to know the bare basics so that you know enough to delegate. So that's really the important point in this lecture is to look at the overall structure of tax in the context of running a company and know enough to make a conversation about it, not to be an expert in it. There's nothing worse actually than having a director who reckons he's a tax buffer when he isn't and trying to rule the roost. In fact, that's very dangerous when it comes to companies. We've got to look at this on the basis of having a broad overall knowledge. So, there are your taxes in South Africa today and we've got to say there are three big ones personal income tax, VAT, and corporate tax. Very importantly, when one looks at a director's fiduciary duties, all three of those taxes come into play. Yes, a company will pay corporate tax, but it also acts as representative taxpayer to collect the other two big taxes. You have to collect employees tax from your employees and hand it over to SARS. You have to collect VAT from your customers and hand it over to SARS. And in fact, when it comes to income tax infringements, those taxes are even more dangerous than the corporate tax itself. So we have three areas of responsibility. So, when one starts off with tax, one doesn't start off with big legal cases, etc. You really got to have a look at it from the point of view of the different types of taxpayer. Now, let's have a look at it as being saying, we have individuals in South Africa who have the constitutional right to, chain, to trade in their own names. Then they will pay tax on their business profits in their own names. A lot of professional people do that. Then we get others who say, I don't want a company. I want to extend the concept of trading as an individual into a partnership situation. Now, income tax doesn't recognize a partnership as being a separate taxpayer. A partnership really is just a group of individuals who split up income and report their portion of the income in their personal tax returns. Then we have the trusts and there are some clever dicks in South Africa who believe that trading through trusts is a good way to go. What you've got to know about that is it's dangerous waters to go into. It's got incredibly complicated and it's under the spotlight with SARS at the moment. So all the old rules about when, form, when in doubt form a trust have essentially gone out of the window and have to be readdressed. But that would be outside the base knowledge of a director or an MBA or a PDEM. Then it comes to those who want to form a company. That's your usual trading vehicle. That's got its own set of rules. 
All taxpayers have essentially the same definition of taxable income within those categories. There are a few little exemptions that might affect you. For entrepreneurs, there is the concept of the small business corporation, which has a lovely tax incentive if you can get it. We'll look at that later. And then for micro business, we have turnover tax. That's for survivalist businesses with a turnover of less than a million rand a year. They are encouraged to register under the turnover tax system. They will pay very, very little tax because they don't make very much profit. And that's purely an ease of administration provision, which is there for survivalist business. Now look at your categories of businesses. Survivalist businesses are right down the bottom. We're not really concerning ourselves with them in a PDEM or in an MBA. We are dealing with entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs generally are not survivalist businesses. They are looking to employ people and they would be taxed either as individuals, hopefully substantial taxpayers, or they would be small business corporations or they would be taxable as companies. So don't concern yourself too much on the turnover tax principles. It's a way of keeping the formal sector legal without with the minimum of compliance requirements. We'll look at it very briefly later on. So you have your types of trading entities. Let's start off with what's wrong with just trading as an individual or a partnership. And we go back to our basic notes on this, where we said, right, the advantages are it's simple. Very little or a hell of a lot less paperwork, a lot less formality, you've got full control over what you are doing, and there is no separation of finances, it all goes on one tax return, we don't have multiple tax returns. And finally, there can be certain tax advantages, we'll look at those in a second. The disadvantages are obviously the risk in your own name, your personal tax liability and continuity, those are non-tax matters. Limited access to capital, because when one's looking to raise capital, you generally do that with a company. And there are certain tax disadvantages when, we, when one gets up to high-level income individual taxpayers. Individual taxpayers can pay tax in terms of the sixth schedule, that's turnover tax, if their turnover is less than a million rand a year. Hopefully we're not going to have to bother ourselves with that in this course but we'll cover it later. Then, when one looks at partnerships, there are the advantages of economy of scales, sharing profits and losses and greater access to funds because you've got a more substantial business. The same individual tax advantages are pertinent to partnerships as to those who trade in their own name as sole traders, down the lower end of the tax scales. We'll see that in a minute. And the disadvantages are more or less the same as an individual, except that you are jointly and severally liable with your partners. And if you are taxed as a partnership, your higher end income can attract a lot more tax. Again, we need to have a look at that in a bit more detail. So there are the tax tables that have emanated over the last two years. What you can say about individual tax in South Africa is that we have very advantageous rates of tax up to 550,000 rands income a year. By international standards, that's pretty low. What you've got to know is that if you stick your nose over 550,000 rands per annum, then the tax rates start to climb well above corporate tax rates, 39% and then 41%. And that's why it can be a disadvantage to be an individual taxpayer or a partnership where you are reporting taxable income to be taxed in terms of the individual tax rates. We'll see in a moment that corporate taxes can be potentially a lot lower. We see in South Africa that there is a small group of individual taxpayers, some 500,000 of them whose income exceed 500,000 rand per annum, and they bear the brunt of the tax increases that we have had over the past two years. They're looking to get a little bit more from them. The biggest problem in South Africa today is actually that we don't have enough high-end taxpayers, so no matter what tax rate you put on them, you're not going to get a hell of a lot more out of the personal income tax system. 
What you have to know as a business person is that your top rate of tax is 41% for an individual. You can see from that table that that 41% is substantially higher than a company at 28%. 13% higher if one excludes the dividend tax. And that's demonstrating that point, that it's not tax efficient to be taxed as an individual on your revenue trading income once you go over that 500,000 rand per annum. We also see that individuals have a lower capital gains tax rate, top end capital gains tax rate than do companies. So although a company will pay less tax on its trading profits, when it comes to capital gains tax, particularly if one includes dividend tax, you're going to pay a hell of a lot more tax. So you can't have it all ways. But as far as capital gains tax is concerned, the individual taxpayer is always king. Right. So there's your individual taxpayer and his advantages and disadvantages, whether you're an individual or you are working in a partnership. The next one up is a trust. Now the taxation of trusts is extremely complicated and one really shouldn't do it with our professional help. If you go and try and wing it alone, you, there are all sorts of pitfalls that you can sit, fall into with the so-called attribution system because you can land up taxed either as a trust or taxed as an individual and the rates are substantially different. What we find with trusts is that they have, if they are, we only the trust is taxed, we have a 41% flat rate of tax. There's no marginal rate from, of tax for trusts unless they're special purpose trusts. Um, we pay 41% in the RAND um, from RAND 1. We also find that trusts have a much higher rate of capital gains tax if the trust is taxed than does an individual. In short, when it comes to trading, it's often not a good idea to go anywhere near trusts, and I think we can leave the debate right there for purposes of this lecture. So, that takes care of individuals, partnerships, and trusts. The next one up is the big one, the company. And we've got to say, right, companies can be taxed in two forms. Most companies are taxed as companies at a flat rate. But there's a sliding rate of tax for small business corporations, which is enjoyed by a handful of entrepreneurs. We'll look at them in a little bit more detail later in this lecture. And then a company can also uh, register under the turnover tax system. Most companies don't use that option, but the option is available. Right, so we've got a company. And our advantages were it's a separate legal persona. It has limited liability, greater access to capital and continuity. When it comes to tax, companies have a lower rate than individuals. You have the flat rate of 28% versus the top rate for individuals at 41%. Remember, of course, at lower ends of taxable income, individuals are taxed on a sliding scale. So companies are taxed at 28% from the first round. So there are instances in the lower levels of income where a company can be disadvantageous from a tax perspective because its tax rate can actually exceed the individual tax rate, particularly if one adds on dividend tax. The disadvantages for companies are all the formalities and the compliance work. When one talks compliance and companies and tax, remember, it's not only compliance with the Companies Act and all the forms that have to go in there. It's separate. A company is taxed as a separate legal persona, so you are doubling the number of tax returns. So there's a lot of work and going on with keeping a company's books and records going. You have onerous responsibilities of directors, and those onerous responsibilities of directors through Section 76 of the Companies Act land up with the directors having to deal with the company's income tax. And they can't shirk their responsibility in saying, well, I didn't know, because Section 76 over and over again is saying, you should reasonably have known what is going on, or you should have delegated it to find out what was going on. When it comes to companies, we've got that nice 28% tax rate, which can be lower than the individual rates, but 
we have effectively a higher CGT inclusion rate, which means companies pay a higher CGT rate than individuals. And remember then there is a second tax on corporate profit distributions, which is called dividend tax, that's withheld at 15% of the amount distributed. It's quite a technical area. But that takes the all-in tax rate on companies, not to 28%, but to 37,39% for revenue income and 31,93% for capital income. Now stop there and look at that. That's an important distinction. Because if I own a property in my own name, my maximum ta capital gains tax is 16.4% when I sell it. By just putting it in a company, if I include capital gains tax and dividend tax, I could land up paying 32%. So in the old days, we used to have that wonderful saying, when in doubt, form a company. Well, from a tax perspective, that doesn't apply anymore. Corporate profit taxes can be higher than individuals, particularly on capital taxes. So when in doubt, form a company, there's definitely a question on that when it comes to tax these days. Right, so those are your different types of taxpayers. Now we come to something called the general reduction formula. Now if you ever work for SARS, this is SARS 101. They say, in broad terms, there is only one formula for establishing what your taxable income is. Now remember that in tax, we don't talk about profit very often. We talk about taxable income. And they're defined differently. We can't take accounting profit and pay tax on it. We have to establish taxable income in terms of a different formula, and that formula is called the general reduction formula. Now, the general reduction formula works in brief like this. It says, take your gross income. That's all your income that's established in section one. We'll have a look at that definition in a moment. From that, you can deduct specific types of exempt income. That gives you a concept called income. From income, you will deduct your operating expenditure, which is established on in terms of section 11 and read with section 23. We will then you give you your tax capital allowances, which are substantially different to your normal depreciation rates. And that will reduce you down to taxable income. Once you've got your taxable income, we will then go across and look at what type of taxpayer you are and apply the different rates for the different types of taxpayer against essentially the same taxable income at the end of the day. So what we need to do in this lecture now is to go on and say, let's break that definition down. Now, if you want to break that definition down in a full tax course, you're going to be sitting there for about a third of the whole tax course, just analyzing all the different allowances and how they apply and all the little quirks and snipers that come into the wonderful world of being a tax nerd. Now, if you're an MBA or a PDEM, you're not a tax nerd. You haven't studied that for long enough. So you just need an overall view about what those allowances are all about. So we start off with what is gross income? How, what does SARS recognize as income compared to what's in your financial statements? That can be a very different thing to what your financial statements are recognizing. So we go into section one of the Income Tax Act and it starts off. It says gross income is in the two types of definitions. It says in the case of any resident, that's a South African living here, we'll look at him in a moment, the total amount in cash or otherwise received or accrued or in favor of such person. And then it continues and it says, for anybody who is not resident in South Africa, you are not completely off the hook. You still have to pay tax on your income of a source within the Republic. So we have to say, if you come here from here from overseas, you can't say, well, I didn't live here, therefore I don't pay tax here. You still have to pay your tax on your South African income. Then it carries on in the period of assessment, 
and then it says excluding amounts of a capital nature. In further definitions lower down in the tax and gross income definition, it then seeks to include part of your capital gains. Your capital gains are only partially taxable, whereas your revenue trading gains are fully taxable. Capital gains tax in itself is a whole great big chapter of the Income Tax Act in Schedule 8. And again, you could write a PhD about that you probably would go to an expert if you had a capital gains tax problem. Then the Act goes on and it says we need to dissect that overall definition and say what is a resident taxpayer and what is a non-resident taxpayer because they have two different gross income definitions. Now, when one talks in tax terms, you don't talk about residents being people who are South African nationals or whether they carry a foreign passport. We have a lot of this problem in Cape Town where people think purely because they have a passport from Europe they're never liable to tax in South Africa. It doesn't work like that. Your definition of being a resident taxpayer is peculiar to the Income Tax Act and to try and explain that definition in words is a little bit difficult. So we say that is a great big definition. I don't want to go there. I want to look at a picture. So we say when it comes to asking whether a person is a resident taxpayer, let's summarize it in a picture. We conduct an inquiry. We say, right, if you are an individual, then is this your place of residence? Do you, is this the place from which you return from your wanderings? Is this where you keep your dog? Is this where you've got a house? Is this where you've got your washing machine? In the normal layman's terms, is South Africa your home? But there are cases where it's a little bit vague. And a good example of this is the international sports stars. We never know where they are. Then we have special deeming provisions within the Act, which are the day's present tests, and you can leave them for the likes of Ernie else to consider as to whether he is a South African tax resident. But that's for individuals. Then comes corporates and trusts. Okay, and what we are saying is that if you are a corporate or a trust, if you are registered in South Africa, then you're a resident taxpayer. It doesn't matter where you're managed from. The question only arises with a corporate where they are foreign companies operating in South Africa. And then we refer to whether they have a place of management in South Africa. If they have a place of management in South Africa, they can be incorporated where you want them. If they have a place of management here, the directorships here, etc., then they are a South African taxpayer and they are liable to tax in South Africa. So that's where we get into the wonderful world of do you have a permanent establishment in South Africa or not? You can leave that again to the tax nerds. There's the day's present test. Basically says, do you live here? If not, start counting days. And then it gives various hurdles. So it says, if you spend more than 91 days a year in South Africa, then you have to start counting over the last five years. And if you spent more than 91 days in a year in South Africa for five years, then you go to the next test and you say, overall in those five years, did you spend more than 915 days here? If you did and you pass both tests, then you're a South African resident taxpayer even if you do have a residence somewhere else. Well, again, you can leave this to the likes of the superstars who have management teams who look at those days test numbers and make sure that the likes of any else just don't spend more than 91 days a year in South Africa, that they are resident somewhere else in the world in spite of the fact that they might be a South African national. Different test. Right, so we go to the general reduction formula and we say we look first for residents and then we tax them on all of their income as is defined in the gross income definition. Then, obviously the gross income definition is set as widely as it possibly can. Some of it, they have to let go. And that is what's called exempt income. You find that in section 10 of the Act. Once you've deducted exempt income, you come down to the next term, which is income. Now, the exemptions in Section 10 are very long. Again, you can write a PhD about them if you want to. 
They're in broad categories. The main categories are government itself is obviously not a taxpayer. Public benefit organizations, they don't want to tax them because they're there for the public good. A rehabilitation companies, special institutions, bodies, sporting bodies, clubs, professional institutions, etc. Importantly, retirement funds are exempt from tax. So you can save money in your own name and the income and capital gains that you generate in your private portfolio would be subject to taxation on an annual basis. However, if your savings are sitting in a retirement fund, that's hands-off territory because you're providing for your social security in your old age and retirement funds are completely exempt from tax. There are also exemptions in respect of foreign dividends, very technical, and in certain cases dividends are exempt from tax. What happens with individuals in South Africa is their dividend is exempt from tax, but a 15% withholding tax is deducted by the company that pays the dividend. So you've already, although you've received a tax-free dividend, dividends tax has already been deducted from it in the first instance. And then there are all sorts of special provisions for the nerds to go and have a look at with regard to hybrid instruments. We're not going there in this lecture. So we've got gross income, less exempt income, gives you income. The next step is how much deduction can you claim against your income that you have earned? Now, there are a lot of fallacies about this in South Africa. People think because something has produced income, it is tax deductible. That's not the case. You look at the structure of the Tax Act as being very rigid. It has tests for identifying income. It has separate tests for identifying expenditure. The only place where those two meet is that one can be deducted from the other. There's no consistent logic in tax. That's why a lot of people don't like to study it, because you just can't understand what the legislature is getting at. So, your operating expenses of a business are deducted in terms of Section 11A, read with Section 23G. And so we have to go to 11A, and that gives not the general reduction formula, it gives what's called the general deduction formula. That's for your operating expenses. And it says, you can deduct from your, in deriving taxable income, any expenditure and losses actually incurred in the production of income, provided that such expenditure and losses are not of a capital nature. So that's your open-ended general provision. And you look at that hurdle, and you can cross that hurdle, but please do not forget that Section 11A is not the only hurdle that you have to cross before you can claim a deduction. Because there are further provisions which are hid in Section 23. And they say expenditure may be deductible under 11A, but certain specific types of expenditure are not deductible. We'll run through them quickly. The cost of maintaining the taxpayer and his own. So, 11A might say that I would buy a smart shirt for purposes of going to work, and that's expenditure incurred in the production of income. Tick the box, 11A works. But then the deduction is specifically prohibited under 23 under Section 23A, where it says, if it's the reasonable maintenance of the taxpayer, still not deductible. I can't claim my shirt. There is a letter here where people are allowed to claim a home office, for example. You can do that if your employer does not provide you with an office. There's a specific exclusion for that. What you've got to say with Section 23 is that if you have expenditure in running your home, there's very little scope for claiming a deduction.
activity in this country or activity in other countries that would be unlawful if it was carried out in the Republic. We get a bit of this with Nigeria. They have certain customs and payments that go on in terms of Nigerian uh, entrepreneurship, which are actually considered uh, illegal in South Africa. You can't claim those against taxable income in South Africa because they would be illegal if they were carried out in the Republic of South Africa. So what we see now is that we have general provisions, 11A read, limited by Section 23. Following on from that, there are a range of specific provisions. For example, legal fees, repairs, special provisions regarding pension and provident fund contributions, um, insurance premiums, research and development expenditure, and even donations. Now, the rank and file director of a company doesn't need to know those in detail. Those may be special provisions, and if you have them and they're a problem, you need to get hold of a tax advisor to help you work through them, because there's no logic as to how they work. So carrying on from there, we say, We've looked at expenditure from the point of view of your annual operating costs, your revenue expenses. Now we move over to capital expenses. And this is where we say, right, the re general reduction formula deals with operating expenses. Capital expenses are for specific allowances that we might get on capital goods. Run something like this. There are a range of provisions within the Income Tax Act, for example, that deal with lessees of fixed property. Then there are other provisions with regard to corporeal property, movable, so that would be a car or a machine, special provisions for small business, special provision for intangibles, or what in tax terms we call incorporeal properties, and then there's a range of other allowances. Now, we do not require the MBA or PDEM student to know these in intimate detail. I'm going to fly through them, but basically what we need to know is the structure of the Act and how that this is applied. So there are special provisions regarding the rental of fixed property. We've got special provisions for lease improvements in terms of lease agreements and special provisions relating to these premiums where we pay a lump sum of rental up front for a fixed property. Then we have capital allowances, the wear and tear allowances as you write off your assets over a number of years. There are general allowances and then there are specific incentive allowances in Section 12C that deal with plant and machinery that allow you to write off machinery, etc., faster than you would in its normal economic life because they're trying to incentivize you to buy plant and machinery. So those are flat rates, irrespective of how much of the year you use them. Then we have, apart from that, special accelerated allowances for small businesses. They are contained in Section 12 that give an accelerated write-off of business assets acquired by entrepreneurs who are classified for tax purposes as a small business corporation. The small business corporation is allowed to write off its manufacturing assets in full in the first year that they are acquired. Other assets are written off 50% in the first year, 30% in the second year, and 20% in the third year. To get these special allowances, there is an extensive definition of what is a small business corporation. Now, if I wanted to be hard on a class, I could set a lovely question about that, because there are all sorts of disqualifications from the SBC framework. What it basically means is, if you are a company and your trade turnover is less than 14 million rand a year, and it's the only company that you own. You don't own any other companies. Then, subject to some certain other specific provisions, you may be able to fall within the small business corporation tax rates. And what this means is that you get a different tax rate 
for an SPC compared to a normal company. A normal company is taxed at the rate of 28% from Rand 1. What we see with small business corporations is that they have a sliding scale of tax up to 550,000 Rand per annum, where the 28% tax rate kicks in. Now, this may represent a corporate tax saving on 550,000 rands taxable income of about 90,000 rand a year. It's specifically put there to encourage small businesses to incorporate and start getting going as entrepreneurs. But it's tricky stuff. And it's not the sort of stuff that an entrepreneur should really worry themselves about. They should simply know that if I've set up a company as an entrepreneur and my turnover is less than 14 million rand a year, hey, I might have a little bit of a bonus on my tax bill that might be quite advantageous. I should get to an accountant who knows what he's talking about with this and can help me. But it's a lot of paperwork that we've got to get involved. We also have the micro business schedule. We've mentioned that before where if your turnover is less than 1 million rand a year, you can pay tax on turnover alone. What it means is that if your, your total income is less than 335,000 rand a year as a micro business, there's no tax liability at all. And even on turnover of a million rand a year, you're only going to pay tax of 14,150 rand. So it's a bonus for the micro business sector. But hopefully, if you're attending this class, you're intending to have turnover of more than 1 million rand a year, so you won't need this. So, there's the definition of what is a micro business. Again, it gets awfully technical, and the reason is to curb a lot of tax evasion where people try and hide under the mantle of being a micro business. Um, you don't need to go there. If you are simply registered as a taxpayer, you can ignore all of that. You might look at this if you are an entrepreneur who's just getting going on a business and doesn't want to have a whole lot of paperwork, um, and you're just trying off an experiment on this. Um, but otherwise, the application of this is pretty limited stuff. So, carrying on, we have special commercial building allowances in terms of Section 13. If you have commercial buildings that are bought new, you can write them off over 20 years if they are used in your business. There are further provisions in Section 13 which allow for other buildings to be claimed, for example, residential property, if you own a certain number of units. But those allowances are pretty small. They're only 5% per annum. And then, we, apart from the residential buildings allowance, we also get an urban development zone allowance. Urban development zone allowances are there for the regeneration of the old city centres of South Africa, where they give an accelerated allowance on wear and tear if you go and buy buildings, for example, in central old Johannesburg. These allowances are quite attractive if you want to go and look in those areas. But obviously, if you're not living in one of the old urban centres, it's pretty much irrelevant. Then, the Tax Act also has specialist provisions relating to hotel keepers, railways, aircraft, strategic industrial projects, and the like. Outside of scope, the only thing that you've got to have a look at if you're on MBA on this, is that there are what we call uh, industrial development incentives where we have major projects within certain specified areas uh, nominated by the Department of Trade and Industry. An example there would be the Kocha project. Then you can get lower tax rates and better tax incentives on writing off your assets. You can get special employment incentives um, and the like. But again, it's not day-to-day -day stuff. When you are a company, you've also got to be aware that you pay your tax three times a year. It works like this. After six months, you will pay half a year's tax based on what your profit was in the previous year. Very importantly, as a director, when you get to year end, on the year end day, you have got to pay your taxes for the year. Otherwise, there can be a big penalty. So one has to bring in 
through the management of a company, a way of assessing your taxable income at year end so the correct amount of tax can be paid. There are also, for smaller companies, ways of paying um, by way of third provisional tax payment, six months, often year end, um, but most of it is paid by way of the first and second provisional tax payment. So again, the year-end payment is the big risk one that we've got to watch out for. Provisional tax is generally run by an accountant who knows how it operates. It's a high-risk area within a business as to how and when we actually pay it. Um, and again, what we would do is seek to delegate that down from the board to make sure that all compliance requirements are met. Right, so that puts us through a basic introduction about what the Income Tax Act is about. Please, it's very important that for, for if you get it wrong in terms of the Income Tax Act, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And thus it is the board's requirement to say, we've got to manage our tax affairs using specialists so that we don't get on the wrong side of SARS. I'm Matthew Lester at the Rhodes Business School. Thanks for your attention.